Good morning and welcome to the uh, the NEC Users Annual Conference for June 2021. Um, a really important topic that you'll be hearing from today on, on Net Zero and um, some great speakers. Uh, before we start, I'll uh, go to some housekeeping. Can you move the slide? Thank you. Um, so if you can please keep all your mics off um, for the introductions. Um, you can submit your questions uh, through presentations by the chat function um, and you'll be uh, brought in by uh, the NEC team in order to uh, give you questions over. Um, the presentation is being recorded uh, and will be available online in the next few days. We'll be sending out copies of the slides and delegates to, to delegates uh, after the session. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, thank all our supporters for all the help in spreading the message um, and getting everybody here today for this uh, conference. You can see the list of supporters uh, on this slide. I'm not going to go through them all individually, uh, but thank you. And we've got some exciting news from the users group um, to adapt to our new online world. Um, we've made our membership offering global, uh, four levels of corporate membership so that anybody from any organisation in the world can join, uh, as well as a new grade for individuals and affiliate bodies. Uh, the aim is to keep the growing interest uh, going in the NEC contracts worldwide. <laughs> Thank you. This will be launched at the beginning of July and from any information on, on the uh, uh, new levels, I'm sure the, the NEC team will uh, let you know. Um, as a thank you for attending, we're offering all our delegates a complimentary copy of uh, FM contract. Uh, you can download this by uh, finding the resources icon on your screen. This will be tired time stamped, so will expire on the 30th of September. Um, and a presentation on the new contract will be delivered by Linda House Marnis of the Institute of Workplace and Facilities Management in the Across Sectors section. So please make sure you're registered for that. Um, we have a great programme this year and um, this morning we'll focus on how the industry can work together in achieving uh, net zero, which is really um, something that's important both to government um, the industry, but to society as a whole. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, we'll also, um, tomorrow, we'll be looking at some NEC case studies for facilities management in the oil and gas industry. And also Peter Alexander from AstraZeneca will be talking about how NEC contracts have been used for project delivery in the pharmaceutical sector. So that should be an interesting one. Um, we'll conclude with the Global Reach session on Wednesday, which will kick off um, the famous NEC award ceremony and future presentations from the Hong Kong Development Bureau and the Square Kilometre Array Organisation before ending with a presentation and afternoon workshop delivered by the NEC and Dispute Resolution Board on dispute resolution using DABs on an international engineering project. Now on a personal note, uh, unfortunately for me, this will be my last NEC conference um, that I'll be opening uh, as I'll be handing over my new role to my friend and colleague, uh, John Welsh. We'll see at the end of three years where he's still my friend and colleague after this. Um, John's the Deputy Director of Construction in the Commercial Services, and I can't think of a better person uh, to be handing over to. Um, before I hand over, I'd like to take this opportunity to say uh, how much I've enjoyed being the user group chair, being part of the community in the last couple of years. Um, I've attended and chaired the annual conference both in the UK and Hong Kong. And it's been great to see the NEC flourish in these regions. I've also um, seen the NEC be adopted in new regions such as Peru for the um, Lima Olympic Games, Belgium for the Austinville project and Sydney for the Partnering for Success programme. I'd like to thank the NEC team for their support, um, especially Rekka, who asked me to take up the role in the first place, um, and Cheryl for trying to keep me on track both home and overseas. Uh, and of course, it wouldn't be the same without me thanking Jane Halstrap from the IPA, um, who's been my right hand woman and really kept me um, in line. Uh, I've no doubt the NEC will go from strength to strength. I'm excited to see uh, how the new users group will develop in the new regions, the new model, um, and as I say, under John's leadership, 
uh, I'll now hand over to John to take over. To you, John. Great, thank you, David. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the um, the handover. And yeah, we'll uh, we'll rebaseline in three years. Hey, um, so I'm excited, obviously, to to be here today as your new chair and taking over the baton from from David. And I know I speak for the whole of the NEC team by extending a massive thank you um, across to you, David, for all of the work you've done over the, the three years in helping this user group grow um, as a community, raising its own profile, but of course, raising the profile uh, of NEC itself right across the world. Um, and although you're leaving the role, I'm pretty sure that we'll still be together um, working on different initiatives to further continue to promote this collaborative ethos of uh, of the NEC forms of contract as best practice across our industry. So thank you, David. Uh, and yeah, I appreciate the opportunity here. So I'd just like to take this uh, this chance to make a quick introduction then. So as David says, my name is, is John Welsh. I'm Deputy Director of Construction at Crown Commercial Service. And I've got ooh, over 20 years experience in the construction industry in different sectors uh, and across multiple tiers as well. And I've personally seen how NEC can help deliver excellence in project delivery, um, working on it um, through, as I said, through, through different sectors and multiple tiers. Uh, so hopefully I can help uh, the user group uh, and lead it moving forward. OK, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, of course, I'm looking forward to, to taking over fr from David and, and continuing all of the work that, that David's done in promoting the NEC, but also trying to lead it into different markets and sectors. We're going to hear from AstraZeneca tomorrow um, and some other sectors across the three days as well, which is really exciting for us. And as chair, I'm always open to feedback, so um, would really welcome any thoughts or ideas um, from our members uh, for me on, on you know, how I can form this role uh, and build on all of the good work that David and, and the NEC team already do. So thank you for that. And I'm now going to move us on to the conference itself. So this morning's session welcomes uh, an impressive panel of speakers right across government and industry to help us try and better understand the current infrastructure challenges and priorities when it comes to delivering better uh, and greener project solutions that specifically support UK's 2050 net zero obligation. Uh, and wider resilience needs around social value, et cetera. The session will begin with an opening address by Rachel Skinner. Uh, Rachel is president of the ICE, um, who put forward this particular objective as one of her priorities, um, taking over that role to focus on um, when she started last year, 2021. Um, and then we'll move across to a pre-recorded video message from our construction minister, Anne-Marie uh, Trevelyan, uh, on government's approach to delivering greener industrial revolution, um, followed by a session by Bridget Rosewell, Commissioner from the National Infrastructure Commission. Um, so Bridget's going to talk about the roadmap to decarbonisation and, and what that looks like. Uh, we'll then conclude with a presentation from Matt Brown. Uh, Matt's from the Cabinet Office and he'll provide an update on the uh, recently published construction playbook on nearly, nearly six months ago now, isn't it? Um, and then we'll follow that by a Q&A from the audience. So please pop your questions into the chat uh, in Teams. I'll do my best to um, to keep control of those and, and we can answer as many as we possibly can as a panel um, at the end of this session. So without further ado, I'm going to now hand over to Rachel to talk us about how the ICE will support the government in its 2050 targets. So thanks, Rachel. Thanks, John, um, and thanks everybody also for, for joining um, today. So just let me add my welcome very briefly to this conference, wherever you're joining from all over the world. I, I'm conscious we've got people from all sorts of places who, who've joined in to, to listen to these sessions over the next couple of days. Um, so my role today, as you've just heard, is essentially to add, I suppose, my own perspective really about the, the, the crucial links between climate action and the potential to evolve our forms of contract to support lower carbon real outcomes from now. Um, and as many of you will know already, my whole year as ICE president is focused really on just one single theme, which I've called Shaping Zero. And it is essentially all about 
the crucial importance of moving to a net zero carbon position as fast as we possibly can. And I'll come back to that point around speed in just a moment. Um, if we're going to limit the worst effects of climate change and its genuinely existential threats to all of us in the years to come, but also the need to adapt in any case to cope with the effects of at least 30 years of a worsening climate that lie ahead of us for the years to come. So my goal very simply for this year is to reach essentially as many people as possible, really tens of thousands of, of civil engineers, of infrastructure specialists, other wider people working in, in the broad fields where, where this sort of thing you know, has a, has a relevance, um, maybe even more than that if we possibly can, reaching maybe hundreds of thousands of people all across the world to deliver a really simple message around acknowledging and understanding the hard links between what we all do as infrastructure specialists every day and the root causes of climate change. And I'm sure most of you will be well aware by now, but just for the avoidance of doubt, roughly speaking, 70% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions can be traced back in some way, shape or form to infrastructure. And that's both because of the way we plan and design and build things, but also because of the behaviours that we effectively enable because that infrastructure exists. So that's everything from transport to buildings, heating to cooling, water, waste, digital, the whole lot. Every single infrastructure asset, new and old, had a carbon impact when it was first built. And most of them continue, of course, to have an impact every day now as we use those assets inside our infrastructure systems every day over lots and lots of decades and generations. And that matters, of course, because those same carbon emissions are the primary cause of climate change in today's world. And that to me, and I'm sure to many of you, if not all of you, is just it's not acceptable because it means that as a whole profession, we just need to face up to the fact that over the past 200 years, we have, in fact, been causing unintended harm, but nevertheless harm. So our actions from now are going to define, I suppose, our identity, our, our place in the world for the decades to come, because that harm is real. And on the, on the one hand, it is a massive problem. On the other hand, we have a huge opportunity to help address these issues, both by attacking and cutting our carbon emissions, through a mix of absolute reduction, but also mitigation of the now known impacts through both, for example, nature-based solutions, but also carbon capture technologies of various different types, but also defending against the growing effects of climate change, as I mentioned. And that brings me very neatly round to the topic of today's conference, because one of the most common bits of feedback I've been hearing over the last seven months is that people very often say they're very keen to jump in and act on this climate agenda. They're very keen once they see the link to, to start to, um, to understand what they can really do. But very often the end of that same sentence is, but I need a mandate. I need somebody to tell me, to, to authorise it, I suppose, in, in, in the round. So they, they feel, a lot of practitioners out in the industry, that they need clear instructions to deliver against a lower carbon set of goals, as well as other project outcomes and values and so on, depending on what it is we're trying to do. Now, to some extent, I agree. Uh, I understand that sort of statement coming through um, because obviously, you know, a clear form of contract is one of the keys to incentivizing the right behaviours, the right decisions, the right type of collaboration. And also, of course, it does act as a backstop to protect against the exact opposite. But to do this really well, there are three specific things I thought I'd like to share with all of you today in kind of kicking off the, the discussions and so on. The first one is that speed matters here. We are already too late to avert the impacts of climate change that are already here. And we have absolutely no way of predicting with any real certainty where the next disaster will occur. So we have to agree together that it is worth the effort to attack these carbon impacts and to defend against the potential impacts on the basis that this is the strategy that will be our best hope at guarding against those worst effects getting even worse as the years go by. So we do not have two years to sit and debate this before we start. We certainly don't have five years or 10 years or 20 years. We are already behind the curve. And so to me, we have to just get into a mindset of putting our trust in the right direction of travel, getting on with it and being ready to adjust the detail as we go. The second thought is that practice matters. And what I mean, I suppose, by that is that in a contract sense, as I'm sure we're all aware, you know, the words that appear on the piece of paper are one thing, but the actual changes we need to see go far beyond the letter of the, the contract and, and the, 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 the tiny details that we could scrutinise and debate, you know, we for need to see weeks on end. Um, we actually need to make sure that all of this flows into real sustained behaviour change. So this is not the time for contract related game playing. It's not the time for temporary measures. 
this is about whole teams shifting their mindset and thinking whether it, whether it's from an investor mindset, a client mindset, a consultancy, a contractor mindset, everybody needs to commit and move together in the same direction so that the actual practice changes, not just talk about practice or commitment to practice and that kind of thing. We actually need to see that real change coming through on the ground. And my final thought really on this is that, and this might sound a little bit provocative, I suppose, in this particular context, other things also matter besides the contract. It isn't just about the contract. There are hundreds of other actions that all of us can be taking as practitioners in our own rights to make similar changes to reduce the climate impacts of what we do in any case, contract or no contract. So yes, um, some of these changes will end up potentially costing a little more than current practice, at least in the short term. But actually, an awful lot of these carbon benefits are out there for an equivalent cost or maybe even less cost than current practice. So in fact, despite the fact that a lot of people say they need this mandate, there are loads and loads of other things we can do as well. So we need to ask ourselves the right questions. We need not to be afraid to start small because every little bit of change will actually help here. But what I, what I suppose I'm really trying to say is that we mustn't rely just on a contract mandate to get us out of trouble here, because I suspect that that on its own won't actually be enough. It's part of a bigger picture. So I guess to sum up, it feels to me that we're on a journey here. And it is fantastic to know that the NEC team and all of you as practitioners are also on this journey as well. We have a lot to sort out around outcomes, around meaningful measurement, around whole life thinking, useful incentives and so on. But hopefully the discussions over the, over the course of this conference will help to trigger some, some ideas and thoughts around all of that. So I think that just leaves me really with one big question for all of you, which has turned out to be my question of the year throughout my entire IC presidency so far. Um, in a nutshell, when it, when it comes to climate action towards net zero, what are you going to do? Thank you. Thanks, Rachel, for that. Um, wow, powerful presentation. And I think it's probably three takeaways for me there. Speed, practice and um, step up, be bold behaviours uh, as well. So, yeah, um, thank you for that. Really, really appreciate it. Very thought provoking. Um, so we're going to um, watch the video now by the construction minister, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, um, MP. So uh, please enjoy this for the next few minutes. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's a real honour to be speaking at this year's Institute of Civil Engineers NEC Contracts Conference, recognising the commendable role that your organisation has been playing in developing tools and best practices for delivering better, greener project solutions that support the UK's net zero commitment. Of course, we cannot say enough about that subject. After all, climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. And I would like to talk today about the net zero commitment and how government is working jointly with industry through the Construction Leadership Council to drive forward that agenda in the built environment, covering buildings and infrastructure. With buildings and infrastructure making up more of half of UK greenhouse gas emissions, the built environment has a big part to play in reaching that goal. That is why the Prime Minister pledged to build back better, faster and greener a commitment that will drive progress towards net zero carbon emissions in the construction industry. That pledge to build back better and greener was later followed by specific commitments on buildings and infrastructure in the Prime Minister's 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution, which we published in November last year. In March of this year, we government published the UK's first ever net zero strategy for industry. This sets out our vision for a prosperous, low carbon UK industrial sector in 2050 and seeks to provide industry with the long term certainty that it needs to invest in decarbonisation. And of course, this is the year when the UK will host COP26, the UN Climate Conference, and the UK is ready not only to successfully host the conference, but to showcase the many good initiatives of UK industries and organisations aimed at meeting the net zero challenge. This is where the work that the government has been doing in collaboration with industry through the Construction Leadership Council comes in. And this is where the work of organisations such as yours supporting the net zero agenda comes in too. The CLC is an industry government initiative, which I co-chair with Andy Mitchell, the CEO of Tideway. Last month, the CLC welcomed the publication of the Vision for the Built Environment, an industry-wide vision that puts forward wide-ranging, long-term ambitions for creating a low-carbon built environment. 
Specifically, the CLC works through the Green Construction Board, its net zero and sustainability work stream to improve the efficiency of existing buildings, to embed net zero in new constructions and embrace smart construction and digital design. One area where the CLC has recently been very active is with respect to infrastructure, which of course has a pivotal role to play in accelerating decarbonisation towards the net zero commitment. To that end, the CLC, working through the Green Construction Board, has developed a number of initiatives designed to ensure faster decarbonisation in infrastructure projects. Three of these are worth mentioning, not least because the ICE has been involved in them. One is the Infrastructure Carbon Review, published in April, setting out what the industry can do to increase maturity of decarbonisation in infrastructure projects to achieve net zero carbon. The second is PAS 2080, an international standard for managing infrastructure carbon, providing a common whole life carbon management framework. If the ICR is about what to do to measure and manage carbon in infrastructure, PAS 2080 is about how to do it. So it's an important piece of work. Then finally, there's the low carbon concrete route map, which is aimed at decarbonising concrete, one of the most used materials in construction. My department has been pleased to support and co-fund some of these projects, and I'm delighted to see the role that ICE has played in helping to develop them. You will also be familiar with the construction playground, which my department developed for the Cabinet Office, and which is effectively the government's procurement strategy for the construction industry, aimed at incentivising behaviour that would, amongst other things, drive the delivery of net zero carbon in the construction industry. The expectations are that the playbook would transform the relationship between industry and government, moving away from a cost-based approach to procurement to considering other values, including greater environmental and sustainability values. All the above said, it is hard to talk about achieving net zero carbon without mentioning digital and skills. The digital economy has huge implications for the built environment and the UK construction must be at the vanguard of smart construction and digital design. And on skills, it's clear that delivering net zero will require an army of engineers to build offshore wind farms, nuclear power stations and electric vehicles, thousands of retrofitters and plumbers to make millions of buildings in the UK greener and more comfortable, as well as conservationists and foresters to deliver our environmental goals. And we will need people with set in skill sets in green finance, procurement, project management and communications, to name but a few. But despite the scale of the challenge, I'm delighted about the initiatives that government and industry have jointly been developing on the digital and skills fronts. On digital, we are actively promoting digital twin or digital transformation as a tool for achieving net zero in buildings and infrastructure projects. And the initiatives on green skills are moving at pace. As some of you may know, my department and the Department for Education launched a green jobs task force to ensure we have the skilled workforce needed to deliver net zero across the economy. <coughs> Excuse me. And in March this year, the CLC published a skills plan for the sector, aimed to, among others, improve the attractiveness of construction as a career, boost training and apprenticeships, and create clearer pathways into employment in the industry. All the above initiatives lead me to the fascinating programme the CLC has recently developed to pull everything together in a coherent way to drive change in the industry. If you're not already aware, I'm talking about Construct Zero. Construct Zero is an industry change programme in response to the Prime Minister's Net Zero Challenge. It uses the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget to establish nine priorities that frame the action plan and how the construction industry will measure and hold itself to account. The programme sets a framework within which the industry can work to reduce its carbon emissions and includes commitments to decarbonise the materials the sector uses, adopt net zero plants and machinery, improve the way industry design and deliver buildings to make these more energy and heat efficient and improve construction operations to achieve zero waste. I am so pleased that the Construction Zero initiative is gathering support across the sector from large scale companies with a global footprint through to local SMEs and I am really pleased to support it. So a lot is happening in the net zero space within construction and the built environment including buildings and infrastructure. As I said earlier, I recognise the role that ICE has been playing, including through the new engineering contract, NEC, to promote best practices in the industry and to support the UK's net zero commitment.
I welcome your contribution to this important agenda and hope that we continue to work together towards making commercial and social infrastructure greener and more energy efficient. Thank you. OK, so trust you all enjoyed that insightful talk there from our construction minister. I'm so grateful she took the time to actually record um, that that section for us and, and send it on. It's again, it's a really powerful message uh, and to be receiving that directly from the construction minister is, uh, you know, is, is great for for us as NEC users. Um, and I think I'd like to encourage you all actually to just review the documentation and, and policies that uh, the construction minister referred to there. There were, there were multiple, but the, the ones I'd pull out is, is the Greenpoint plan and PAS 2080 and, and construction zero. Um, you know, the, the nine priorities that sets out how we can measure ourselves and hold our industry to account is, is really powerful and really important. Um, I won't draw out the construction playbook. We've got Matt Brown talking about that uh, a bit later on for us. Um, but again, thank you for uh, for the construction minister for for delivering that for us. So I'm going to now pass across to Bridget Rosewell. She's a commissioner at National Infrastructure Commission, uh, and Bridget's going to talk to us about what the roadmap for decarbonisation looks like. So thanks, Bridget. Thanks, John. Um, you just got on to mute, Bridget. I'm no, I'm not. OK, your sound went off a, a sec. OK, am I back? I can hear you, yeah. OK, I don't know what happened there. Sorry. Well, let's hope that works OK. okay. Um, and as Rachel has pointed out to us, that involves all of us and all of us in how we set contracts and, and indeed our behaviours. And uh, it reminds me that as a young consultant, more years ago than I'm prepared to say, I was once uh, once wrote a specification for a contract and uh, the delivery that I was intending to do, and and we started the contract. And then as it proceeded, it became apparent that it would be incredibly difficult to deliver this because the data that we were going to rely on was not as reliable as we had been led to believe. So we found a different way of doing it, which was going to still give the same sort of outcome. But the client said, but you said you'd do this. Yeah, yeah, but we can't do that. So we're going to do this instead because actually it'll be just as effective and you know, and in fact better. Yeah, but you said you'd do that. And this debate, it, it wasn't a very successful um, relationship in fact between myself as the um, as a supplier and my client. And, and what this really shows is the importance of that relationship between the client and the supplier and that we need both intelligent clients and intelligent suppliers. And I guess in a way that's uh, all of the, what this is about. Describing what it is you're going to do, but it isn't the be all and end all. And, and again, that was a point that uh, that Rachel made. So that. There's some very interesting articles um, actually in the latest um, proceedings of the Institution of Civil Engineers, and I recommend all of those to you. There's some um, important pieces of research, I think, about how we all need as engineers to be thinking differently. But we also need to make sure that others are coming along that journey, and I guess in a way that's what I'm going to talk about this morning. So if I can have the next slide, please. The um, this this slide sort of illustrates that theme, I guess. So here on um, the left hand side is Rishi Sunak unveiling the logo of the new investment bank, infrastructure bank, which is going to be uh, housed um, operating out of Leeds. Uh, so that's where he is um, in, in this picture. And so that is the kind of, if you like, um, support for my, my my theme around we will need to be collaborating in providing and, and developing the projects that we do across all streams of activity including finance and of course the infrastructure bank has as its um as, as a, one of its mantras that it must support green and uh, and and the aspects of green economy 
uh, that are coming forward within the projects that are being suggested to it. So that's one really important thing, the finance aspect of this. And I don't think that's just government finance, not just the, the infrastructure bank itself and whatever funding it has from government, which actually isn't massive, so up to 12 billion, isn't going to pay for very much. But the point is how it leverages private finance. So again, how we construct <clears throat> those financial arrangements is going to be incredibly important and needs the relationships with banks and, and other financial organisations and indeed insurance companies in providing funds. So, for example, I was talking to one insurance company who have a, a big um, green um, climate recovery fund available up to four billion. How are they going to find the projects in order to invest in those? And so that I think how we think as in thinking about contracts, not just about delivery of a particular set of stuff, but delivery of outcomes and how those outcomes then uh, perform for the investors who are making them. It may be much wider than just um, the delivery of a particular piece of physical infrastructure or, or some buildings. And that's reinforced, really, I suppose, by this picture on the right, which is all about, uh, that's the EV, obviously, EV charging um, stations, which are slowly being rolled out or indeed quite rapidly being rolled out across the whole country. But of course, it's that's not, again, it's not just about a piece of physical infrastructure, some posts and some plugs. It is also about the availability of the vehicles to drive. It's about the, um, the willingness to pay for those vehicles. It's about the, um, the, the alleviation of what's known as range anxiety, completely irrelevant for most of us most of the time who don't drive our cars, don't drive our cars very far um, if, uh, you know, it's just to work and back, charge at home overnight, charge at work, a bit of a top up when you're there, actually. How long, how often do you need to do more than 100 miles or 130 miles without actually stopping? Hardly ever is the answer. So getting people used to the idea of what it is that they want a vehicle to do, or indeed whether they need a vehicle, I'll come back to that in a bit. But there's a whole lot of behavioural change happening here. And therefore, one of the other really important things is what is the attitude of the public to the um, what is the attitude of the public to the changes that we need to make? And so all of this is, is I think, really important. Behaviour change, collaboration. And of course, the government is setting for us really quite a, an ambitious agenda. And the National Infrastructure Strategy that they published, a little bit later than we wanted them to, it's true, for the UK, has, has sort of put some, some pointers down in that area. One of the really biggest challenges in all of that, of course, is heat decarbonisation. Next slide, please. So here's the sort of here's the challenge, if you like. So on the left, we have what we're all used to doing. There is a standard gas boiler being fitted by somebody who's been trained to do that, who probably does lots of them. And on the right, we have some, uh, in this case, air source heat pumps, um, which are and, and the minister also referred to this. Um, the, the minister referred to the need to make or make sure we've got all the skills available to enable us to do this. The ambition is for 600,000 heat pumps a year to be installed. At the moment, we do not in this country have the capacity to do that, and not many other countries do too. So we need to make sure that we are really thinking about well, what are both the um, the contractual relationships, the policy relationships and uh, the other aspects to that that we will need in order if we're going to really meet that ambition and indeed the varieties of ways in which we will need to meet it. Because it's not just about some air source heat pumps and these are quite small ones actually sitting here. I've got to, I'm, the one I'm going to have is a lot bigger than that. Um, so um, ground source is still a good possibility for um, larger buildings and for small communities. So how are the ways in which we're going to make sure that we can do that? And there are companies working on that. But again, there's a contractual 
relationship there. And it also comes into the financial arrangements. And this comes back, I think, to who the right client is and possibly the devolution aspects of this and empowering communities, local authorities to be able to raise the money to write the contracts to invest in, say, a ground source heat pump for a, a local area, a housing state, whatever. Um, and then also, indeed, how we're going to make sure that we're really accelerating some of the experiments around hydrogen. I'm not completely convinced on the hydrogen economy as yet. I think we have some real challenges to create green hydrogen and just the blue hydrogen. And whether the, um, the although obviously the hydrogen is then easily stored, they, you're still using the electricity and wasting some electricity in the production of that hydrogen. So I think there's still there's still some challenges there. And although in the NIC, one of the my sort of mantras is what are the investments that I think we need to make regardless? I mean, any scenario that I can imagine, we need more digital, for example. Almost any scenario that I can imagine, we need electric vehicle charging networks. I'm not convinced that in all scenarios or most scenarios that I can imagine that the hydrogen economy will work. And there's some technical challenges that we all need to, to get on top of. And again, that requires being able to develop the right mechanisms to get that um, to get to get those um, experiments and those pilots getting going. And now one of the things that the NIC is very much uh, intending to do is to try and make sure that we continue to put the pressure on to create the capacity and the, the uh, capability for making those experiments. Uh, next slide, please. And this comes back to where we think the future might go. So I want to say a little bit about our uncertainty about the future and therefore the need to build flexibility into both our plans and, and how we're thinking about that future. So we've done some work at the NIC about post-COVID scenarios and obviously transport is one of the biggest implications of that and here we have you know, that's uh, illustrated by this picture of a few people, in, including a, uh, a care worker um, on trains and everybody wearing masks. We may continue to wear masks on public transport for the foreseeable future, um, but we'll need to get more people back onto those public transports. And we're beginning to see, in fact, I tried to book a train only this morning, only to discover the train I wanted was sold out um, because of the limitations of the number of people that can get on it. And that's obviously a signal that more people are moving about more. But we don't know what the even the short term, let alone the medium term responses to the changes that we've seen are going to be and what that means for the development of infrastructure. Uh, are people going to want to continue to meet? Well, I think so. Um, and certainly the, in the bank, I chair, it's quite interesting. I've got 10 to 15 percent of people desperate to get back into the office full time. 10 to 15 percent of people not at all desperate, very happy working from home, it's the way their family works or the way that their relationships work, or indeed the, the sort of people they are, they don't necessarily want to be in the office all the time. But that means that almost everybody, the 80 percent, want to be in the office at least some of the time and they want to be able to talk to people, get together, have the water cooler moments, all of that stuff is really important. And I don't know about you in the audience, but I think that one of the things I've um, discovered in doing all of this over the last year is you can I can reach more people, I can talk to more people, but I can't connect with those people in the same way as I would be able to do uh, face to face, cup of coffee, glass of wine, um, a bit of a chat in the in the corridor or even in the in the middle of the conference. It's it's a different way of getting to a point where you actually are doing something. So my suspicion is that offices will come back. It'll take a while. People will go back into transport. Behaviours will change less than we think, but also probably more than we think. Um, something like uh, in the 90s, I was working on Ebsfleet and the High Speed One, and we were talking about the development around Ebsfleet. And people were saying, well, how many jobs are there going to be? What, pe what will people be doing in 30 years' time? To which, of course, my response as a forecaster is, I don't know. And if you'd asked me 30 years previously what people would be doing, and I'd talked about the software industry, you would not have known what I was talking about. 
and, and the, all the developments around Heathrow based on a technology which hadn't been invented at the time. So what we know is that things will be different and we know that they won't be predictable. One of the things that we've been developing in the context of the work we did on rail needs assessment, for example, uh, for 30 years time is let's try and think about adaptability. Again, what do we know we'll, what are we, you know, 90% sure that we'll need? What are we going to take a bet on? What do we think is going to be um, probably worthwhile investing in? And be willing to say, actually, no, that's not going in the right direction. We need to pull back. That is very difficult to do. Uh, I think engineers in particular want to have, you know, here's the solution. We're going to build it. Let's solve the problem. And we'll go on trying to solve the problem, even when it becomes apparent it's not soluble. So I think that um, managing that expectation and thinking about how we build adaptability and flexibility into what we're doing and be willing to change it or be willing to adapt to how people, us, individuals, change their behaviour as, as they go forward is going to be really important. And that brings me to uh, the final section of things that I want to talk about, which is uh, thank you for the slide. This is about biodiversity. Um, picture on the left is actually from Northumbrian Water, where I'm on the board. And this is some work uh, in conjunction with the Northumberland Wildlife Trust um, on the edge of the Kielder Dam, which is building habitat into and hides into the edge there uh, and places where people can watch squirrels, but also the habitat, red squirrels that is, uh, the habitat for those squirrels. Uh, and on the right is a um, the replacement of, um, a picture illustrating replacement of hard landscaping with soft landscaping for water attenuation and management. Um, not sure we're quite there yet. I know places where lots of concrete is being poured for um, flood defence in York, for example, in the UK. So I think this, um, the biodiversity environmental net gain and indeed the nitrogen challenge, which I think is coming up the agenda very, very strongly, increasing amount of attention being paid to nitrogen, which links into methane and greenhouse gases that way, but particularly into soil quality, water quality, uh, presenting nitrate runoff into rivers, algal blooms, all of this, this aspect of things is, I think, uh, very, uh, and for my, me personally, this is, is extremely important, but I think it's also going to be important for the whole of society so that we can make sure that alongside carbon management, which is also important for biodiversity, incidentally, and, and species um, species continuation, that we are thinking about that um, net gain. DEFRA have now put net gain as a requirement into, if you think about nationally significant infrastructure projects, so we're all going to have to be thinking about this. This is no longer about just a few newts, which I know a number of us have in the past been found slightly difficult or even bird nesting. This is about thinking much more um, holistically, much more comprehensively about how the different projects sit together and how then the climate uh, and, and also the climate risk assessment. And we had Climate Change Committee published its latest one uh, only last week. And again, as Rachel said, we're, get, we're too slow. We need to get on this. Nature based solutions can improve resilience. They can improve biodiversity, they can improve the environment for people. You know, there is there's a lot of win win, but it only happens if we're prepared to step back and think both imaginatively and quickly about what it is that we need to do. So a number of agencies are already thinking about this and our design principles, the Commission's design principles were very much um, associated with getting good design, which isn't just about how it looks. It's about how it works. It's about how it can be maintained. It's about the whole life. It's about how you come into the where I want to end almost is where I begin, which is about the circular economy. We've talked about um, in, in, in other presentations about how construction is done. How do we get that into zero waste? How do we get that into a circular economy mindset? So one of the, the two themes which I very much want to see us building into our next national infrastructure assessment, which we're currently beginning to work on, 
and uh, we're working on the baseline for, for it at the moment, the starting point is how you incorporate that net gain and how you think about the circular economy, a zero waste economy, or at least where a reuse and recycle, upcycle, downcycle, whatever, uh, economy, as we move forward over the next 20 or 30 years. Next 20 or 30 years takes us to 2050. That's where we're supposed to be zero carbon. As Rachel said, and I so agree, there is no time to waste. Thank you very much. Bridget, thank you for that. Again, a yeah. really informative and, and powerful presentation. I think uh, for, for me, there's there's lots in there, but I try and summarise uh, the behavioural point actually, and and focusing on delivery of outcomes and changing our behaviours uh, in that kind of way to deliver what we can do collaboratively. But no doubt we'll we'll come back to some of those points in the Q and A bits. But thank you, Bridget. So I'm just going to pass across to to Matt Brown for our final presentation of this morning's session, where Matt's going to be updating us on the construction playbook. So thank you, Matt. Over to you. Thanks a lot, John. Morning, everybody. And um, for those of you I don't know, um, uh, I'm uh, Matthew Brown. I am head of policy in the sourcing program, uh, which is one of the central commercial teams that that sits in the cabinet office. Um, we have been working actually across government over the last couple of years to develop um, essentially best practice guidance for contracting authorities uh, in, in the public sector. And we have uh, worked previously in the sort of um, public services area and, and, and more recently uh, in consultancy uh, and construction. Um, I think uh, the, the sort of presentations uh, this morning, I think, set up really nicely what I want to talk about. I think, you know, the, the challenge, the, the urgency um, and also, you know, the work that's already going on to address those challenges, I think, sets up uh, nicely what I wanted to talk about, which is the construction playbook, uh, which I think actually creates a really nice framework to start to address some of these challenges as we as we look forward. And um, the, the sort of three key things I want to briefly um, cover, and I'll, I'll make sure to leave time for questions, but I really just want to give you a brief overview of, of what the construction playbook is and, and, and what reforms it introduces. Um, I secondly just want to highlight a couple of um, reforms that I think will be of particular interest to this group. Um, and then thirdly, really, um, you know, ha have a bit of an opportunity for us to collectively think about how, how we can take this forward together. Because I think, you know, we've always recognised the easy bit of this is saying what we're going to do. The hard bit is actually doing it in practice and make, you know, make sure, making sure that it, it trans translates into uh, a real world difference. And so having a bit of a think about how we can all take this forward. And um, just to just to briefly give you a bit of the background to uh, to this piece of work and um, it was something that was commissioned uh, last summer by the by the Prime Minister um, and the sort of clear objective we were given was to think about how can we deliver better faster greener public works projects so um, I think there's sort of two things driving that obviously um, a need to, to sort of kickstart the economy as we as we start to come out of uh, the pandemic and, and the sort of key role that the construction sector um, can can play in that. I think the other the other recognition really is that as a, as a government we have you know really ambitious infrastructure plans um, and equally have really ambitious net zero targets. And if we're going to meet both of those things, we need to do things differently and so there's a real sort of burning platform for us to um you know evolve how how we deliver public sector construction projects and um, the way we went about that was through uh, and it may be something that you've heard of uh, was a was a pro is a project called project speed uh, that was uh, as i say commissioned by the pm uh, and is being delivered uh, by by the chancellor and uh, the construction playbook which sets out really how we expect contracting authorities in the public sector to set up uh, contracts in the future was a sort of key strand of that. I think the, the, the key point I'd want to bring out here is that actually this wasn't something where 
you know, essentially we, we sat alone in a darkened room and came up with what we think the, the right answer to that question is. And um, we worked really collaboratively across both the public sector, but also industry and, and particularly through the, the CLC to, to, to come up with a, a package of reforms that both industry and the public sector can, can get behind. And, you know, as we, as we start to look forward to implementation, hopefully that will have real benefits in terms of people feeling a real ownership of, of the reforms that are, that are in uh, the document. Um, just moving on to uh, the next slide, um, I think I just really wanted to highlight that, you know, obviously there's a, there's a sort of focus in this work on, on better, faster, greener. Um, we've always been really clear in, in the document that we, you know, we are um, committed to ensuring that this doesn't come um, at the expense of, of health or health and safety or, or building safety. And so, you know, while there is a, you know, a real need to, to do things differently and, and to do things more quickly, uh, that does not um, mean that there will be, you know, any corners cut on health and safety or, or building safety. And so, you know, I think for the purposes of uh, this presentation, I won't go into too much more detail, but we've, you know, we've worked closely with the uh, with health and safety colleagues to make sure that that, um, that message is, is uh, Sort of throughout the throughout the document, and um, turning to to the sort of key reforms that the that the construction playbook brings in, I think there's there's sort of two key buckets of reforms that that we have have introduced, and and they're on the the next slide. Now I won't go through them in in sort of great detail, but I think they largely fall into two categories. So there is there are a bunch of things that really are about just good commercial practice and making sure that we apply that in a uh, in a construction sense. So um, you can sort of see the list of key reforms on the left hand side of, of this slide. And, um, you know, there are things around number 11, which is around risk allocation, uh, pricing and payment mechanisms. This is all really around making sure that as government, we are not part of creating a, a race to the bottom. Um, you know, you can also see we've got stuff around benchmarking and should cost modelling uh, and um, assessing the economic and financial standing of supplies and resolution planning. So that there's, a, there's a, um, a bunch of reforms that actually we, we apply elsewhere and we wanted to make sure there was greater consistency in how we applied them in a construction context. There's then a, a sort of subset of the reforms we introduced that are really all designed to where appropriate, move towards a greater use of, of MNC. Um, and, and there's a couple of ones that I'll, I'll sort of come to later, but they're, they're particularly the ones that are in red around portfolios and longer term contracting, uh, harmonizing, digitizing and rationalizing demand. Uh, and, and the other one I'll probably draw out is uh, an outcome-based approach, which is about thinking about how we, how we translate um, our sort of key strategic objectives uh, and outcomes that we want to achieve as government into a particular contract. And, you know, I think that's the sort of big challenge uh, for, for contracting authorities generally as, as, we, as you, we look to take this forward. Um, the next slide briefly outlines how we're looking to, to apply this and the sort of scope of the construction playbook. So, as I said, we've worked really closely with um, uh, contracting authorities, both in the in central government and also in, in the wider public sector, so uh, local authorities and um, you know health trusts and the like. And um, I think the, the the point I just wanted to make on this slide is that the, the reforms that we've introduced apply to central government departments and their arms length bodies on a on a, what we're calling a comply or explain basis. So essentially. You know, we expect this to be the model that people um, it, that, that people take forward, unless there's good reason not to. Um, and there, you know, there is an opportunity as you go through the controls process that exists to explain why there may be a better way to achieve a particular outcome. And you know, we're keen to to not um, uh, not prevent innovation in, in that way. So hopefully, that is a it's a it's a sort of flexible regime that will will uh, increase compliance over time. Um, there is a requirement for the wider public sector to take the document into account, um, and, and that really reflects the sort of um, 
you know, the governance, governance arrangements that exist uh, with the wider public sector and the fact that they're slightly different. Um, I think the, the, the sort of point I would make is that we are still working really closely with um, the LGA, local authorities and, and health authorities to, um, to think about how we can support them in, in the sort of key uh, procurements that they have in the pipeline and, and how the approach we've outlined here could be applied to those. Um, you know, I think there's, I think people recognise there's real value in, in this approach um, and uh, keen to think about, you know, whether it be through their training regimes or, you know, the approach taken on particular procurements, how we can support um, them in, in their work. Um, I quickly wanted to just talk through, I think, three uh, of, the, of the reforms that were on the slides earlier. And I think these are probably the ones that uh, have, have sort of most uh, interest for, for this audience, but would definitely encourage you to to have a read of, of, of the documents and, and happy to take questions later on, on any of the things that are in there. And um, I think one of, the, one of the key things that we've uh, introduced through the, the playbook is a uh, requirement to consider whether um, projects would be better delivered as, as a portfolio. So you can see that the example we've used on the slide here is actually rather than thinking about schools all as individual projects, think about them as a portfolio of, of schools, whether that be on a sort of regional basis or, or another basis. Um, and, and, there's a, uh, and then think about delivering those over a, over a longer term contract. So the sort of rationale for um, this approach, I think is probably twofold. So I think that the sort of first part of that is, is looking to take advantage of um, the sort of economies of scale that come from delivering uh, a project in this way. So you have um, a supplier or a supply chain delivering a, a portfolio of, of projects and able to learn the lessons of the first one, apply those to the second and so on and so on and so on. Um, so uh, there, is, um, there is that part of it. I think the second part of it is, is delivered through the longer term contracting. And that's really about giving a, a supplier or a supply chain the certainty of business that comes with actually signing a contract for a number of years, which enables them to then invest in whether it be you know, invest in their people or whether it be investing in, in machinery or, or factories to, to deliver this in, in a way that um, you know, helps us deliver against our, our more strategic objectives of, you know, better, faster, greener um, construction projects. So um, that's one of the, the key reforms that have come in. Um, and uh, the, the, the sort of final point just to flag around that is that in, in making the case to deliver a, a series of projects as a portfolio, one of the questions that we will ask is, you know, how can you do this in a way which um, enables SMEs to still play a role in, in the delivery of, of those projects. So, um, you know, that, that will remain uh, a, a sort of key challenge as these, as these pro proposals come forward. Um, the next thing I just wanted to briefly touch on is what we're calling uh, outcome-based approach. And now this is not necessarily saying we need to contract on an outcome-based approach. But what we have provided is essentially a framework for translating high level strategic outcomes into, into contractual outcomes. Um, so uh, what we've provided is essentially a framework which is called the project outcome profile, which essentially requires a contracting authority to think about what are the, you know, what are the high level outcomes that can be achieved through this project how do they then translate uh, down into uh, departmental uh, outcomes? Uh, and then ultimately, how do they then you know, flow into whether it be KPIs or, or SLAs in, in the contract? And really what this provides is a sort of standard framework that we can use across government to get a bit more consistency in how we think about making these, uh, these uh, decisions and, and, and frankly sort of trade-offs between between the different objectives that each uh, project might contribute to. Um, it's, it's in in a sort of trial phase at the moment. And I think, you know, it's been it's been really, uh, really positive. Um, I think particularly in terms of enabling people to sort of look across government and think about how projects 
can work together to deliver um, deliver outcomes rather than thinking in, in silos. Um, and then the final uh, sort of set of reforms really that I just wanted to touch on is around uh, what we're calling effective contracting, which again is really just about recognizing that as government, we need to make sure that there is a, you know, a sort of healthy, diverse market that we can draw on. Uh, as I said, you know, we've got a really ambitious infrastructure pipeline. Um, and, and as part of sort of government, we don't want to be a contributor to uh, a race to the bottom, as I say. So there are a series of reforms that we think sort of aggregate together to, to sort of help ensure that um, you know it, it is a it's a sort of healthy business proposition for for firms in the UK, um, and you know that we are not uh, we're not supporting um, a market that that you know is sort of uh, working on razor thin margins. And um, so so given time, I won't go through all of those in in sort of great detail, but hopefully you can sort of see the, the sort of themes that come together. To, to sort of make up our, our approach to, to contracting. And um, I really just wanted to then sort of conclude again by uh, highlighting how this document has been developed through collaboration and how, as we start to look towards actually doing this in practice, we're really keen to make sure that that continues. And so sessions like this are really great to help us, to help us do that. And, um, you know, one of the things that we've, um, you know, we, we sort of put at the centre of our, our approach here is about market engagement. And I think, you know, thinking about the sort of challenges of um, delivering net zero, I think one of the things that, you know, we're really going to um, look to industry to do is to really, you know, talk to us and, and tell us what the opportunities are and how we, how we could be doing things uh, differently. Uh, you know, what are the opportunities to, um, you know, deliver things in a, in a way that makes a greater contribution to net zero. Um, and, and we've just really left you with a couple of um, questions that maybe we can sort of pick up in the Q&A session. But, um, you know, we'd be really interested in whether the sort of principles you've outlined here are reflected um, in, in contracts you see. Um, and, you know, from a sort of industry perspective, um, do you feel in a position where you're ready to start responding to contracts when they when they come out along along these lines? So, so John, I'll, I'll pause there and, and hand back to you, and hopefully we've got a bit of time for Q and A. Great, thanks for that, Matt. Um, and, and another really informative um, presentation there. I was proud to be part of the development of the playbook working uh, with Matt and his team and yeah it's it's a great output and, and a document that should be frequently referred to and, and used across our industry. Um, so we're going to move into a Q&A session now there's no questions that have come in through the chat um, at the minute um, but of course I've been jotting a few points down as, as you've all been talking so I will um, I will start off with Rachel um, so again, Rachel, thanks for your presentation earlier. And you mentioned a point within that around um, how important it is for not just sort of engineers from an IC perspective um, to hold some responsibility and accountability in, in trying to achieve and deliver against net zero. You, you think the phrase you used was cross-discipline. So I just wondered how, based on your experience, um, could cross-discipline working actually help support and achieve what we're trying to deliver for 2050. Sure, no, thanks, John. I mean, I think it's always complicated, isn't it? Because we're, human nature is to try and put boundaries around these things and around these skill sets and say, right, you do this bit and you do that bit and then we'll all be OK. I think the nature of this particular net zero challenge, and it, I mean, it, it hopefully came across in everything I was saying earlier on, it really is a monumental one. Um, and, and the potential risk that hang, hangs out there is is almost unimaginable, even after the year of COVID that we've all gone through. Um, I, I think it is one of these ones where unless we can get that collaboration going, that cross sector understanding, that multidisciplinary understanding of actually this is what we are all trying to achieve and this is what we each bring to that sort of problem. I, I think we're going to find that we have a whole lot of pieces that don't add up to being nearly enough to, to sort of, you know, set against the requirements, if you see what I mean. And actually, 
I mean, I, I, I could talk about this for hours, so I'm trying to sort of keep it incredibly brief. But I think it, we, one of the biggest things that we could all do to really help ourselves is not to sit and agonise about the scale of the problem, because it is huge and it's almost it's incredibly difficult to get our arms around it but just to stop and think well what what can I do what could I do how could I join in with this um, and I think it is less helpful to be I guess you know sort of discipline specific or sector specific or whatever because I do genuinely think this this is a systems issue at a global scale so whole planet scale and the only way to solve that is through everybody trying to figure out what they can do to add you know, their sort of best effort, I suppose, into into the mix, whatever that means. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rachel. No, I, I agree. I've, I've written collaboration down multiple times today already. Um, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a sec with, with you, Matt, if that's OK. But firstly, Bridget, probably an, uh, an awkward question to, to maybe crystallise in an answer. Apologies in advance. But you talked about not being able to see the future. Um, which yeah is understandably difficult. Um, but I wondered if you could sort of explain to the users how you think we or they can sort of plan for the longer term um, based on the current context that we're in now. Yes, uh, sure. Um, so it's a question of detail versus generality. So in general, we can absolutely see the the way, and then Rachel set that out, the the, the way in which things are um, developing and evolving. Um, what we can't see in any detail is how our individual actions will in fact affect that. But all we can do is our best. So instead of trying to say, this is you know, the, the whole plan and predict thing that we used to have, is to say, this is what the future is going to be like, and therefore we will do this, this and this. Uh, and that is very limiting. We have to get away from that and we have to say we have to change the future so we're not predicting it we're changing it and these are all the kinds of ways in which each of us can think about how we're going to actually do that uh, and, and for example the application of standards is a good example of this we have some really um risk averse standards in the sense of that plan and predict space which have actually not helped that us to be reactive and flexible in the face of, of climate change, whether that's specification for concrete is one of that I've been kind of quite interested in. How do we think about changing the specification so that we can have more uh, low, low carbon concrete or more use of recycled concrete or use of fly ash? I'm particularly interested in that and making sure we have that as a mineral reserve. There's a whole number of areas where a bit more imagination and a bit more willingness to do things differently will help us down this road but they're not about saying well the future in 10 years time is going to be like this or five years time it's going to be like this it's about being willing to adapt so that you change the future and then you're not predicting it are you you're changing it that's the point yes, yes. i totally totally agree i've just made a, a, a a note of the, that phrase there sorry there's an, there's an echo so yeah not predicting it but changing it it's actually Marx it? said it first and uh, in, in the uh, communist manifesto the yes. philosophers have interpreted the world interpreted the world the point however is to change it and that's the point we're at yeah it is it is i like it thank you so matt just continuing that theme of collaboration then um because each each of you as panel members have talked quite powerfully about it and, and how joining together whether that is disciplines whether that is supply chain tiers or whether it's clients and, and suppliers etc um about how important collaborating actually is to deliver and achieve against these sort of objectives so based on your work with industry developing the playbook um how do you think that taking that collaborative relationship even further forward will help achieve these objectives Thanks, John. Um, I mean, I think actually, and, and this is based on sort of work we've done with different sectors, but I think actually we found one of the most powerful things has been, you know, and in some ways it can be a bit uncomfortable for us, but has been industry holding us to account. So actually, you know, we've set up um, a sort of governance structure and, and sort of opportunities for people to give feedback to the cabinet office on you know, how we're going on implementing the playbook. And I think, you know, 
we genuinely do want to hear how we're doing because you know we have a, an implementation plan that we're rolling out and one of the best ways we know how to prioritize our time and who we need to be talking to is the feedback we get from you know people on, on the sort of cold face who are um who are probably a bad analogy in this context but um people who are um you know sort of working with us and, and can sort of see the detail of what contracts are are coming out so so i would really encourage people you know in a, in a sort of constructive way recognizing that this is a journey we're all on and we're not gonna you know it's not gonna we're not gonna do everything perfectly overnight but we would really encourage people to take um advantage of that and the other thing i just i wonder whether it's just worth flagging john is is the sort of ppn that came out the other week on um carbon reduction plans um, so obviously, you know, as, as part of the bidding process going forward, suppliers will be expected to, to provide their carbon reduction plan. And then over time, will you know, will be um, checked against that as they bid for more government work. So I just wondered whether that was worth a shout out as well. Yeah, no, it, it is, Matt. It is. It's a, it's a good point. And um, sticking with that, then, there's a question that's come in on the chat uh, around how the playbook balanced the need to deliver public projects at lower cost and net zero objective targets and does the latter get priority over the former so so we don't set out any sort of hard and fast rules about how contracting authorities need to make those those trade offs so you know each department has has a plan you know needs to have a plan for meeting its contribution to the net zero target and across its portfolio of projects, we'll need to take decisions about, you know, where best to, to sort of, you know, in a sort of notional sense, spend spend that money to deliver those um, those uh, outcomes. But we don't, as as a sort of central policy, set out, you know, what the the value of that trade off should be. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It does. Thank you, Matt. So Rachel, there's a question for you that's come into the chat. Uh, what change have you seen over the last year in attitude and delivery of the net zero message? Oh, another one I could talk about a long time. Uh, I guess <laughs> what's going to be the good news is it does feel that we are ready now as a sort of a whole set of professionals, I guess, to at least have something resembling a sensible conversation around this. I mean, in terms of the feedback that I've had specifically around the kind of the shaping zero message and I suppose my interpretation of how to sort of explain this as a, as a story and the, and the need to act. I'm getting two types of reactions. The first reaction is, and this is quite commonplace, is that people genuinely express a sense of shock because they did not realise how the dots join together they might well have listened to the radio or watched the news every morning or every evening and heard all the stuff going on in terms of you know increased frequency of natural disasters and they're, they're aware of climate change they don't deny that it's happening but they haven't understood that the way that we do things has a direct impact and a de direct consequence to now in terms of uh, you know actually generating that effect but equally they haven't understood that they could do something about it the other type of reaction i'm tending to get is from people who actually have understood those links and I'm just so relieved that finally we're going to actually talk about it. We're actually going to have a conversation. We're going to see if we can change things. So, I mean, in terms of specific things that are, that are I guess, coming through, I mean, there, there are all sorts of, um, you know, initiatives and so on. And from an ICE point of view, we've put decarbonisation now as our top strategic priority for the next five years. And resilience, the piece around adaptation and defence is the number two top strategic priority. So, so that's a good pairing. That, that is new. And that wasn't just me putting it there. That was a, that was an agreement on on the part of you know the elected trustee board and council in terms of a, a, agreeing, I suppose, that this is a long run focus from an institutional point of view. We've established a, a program of carbon champions, so we're trying to extract good practice, good stories, real project level examples of actually what have you done differently, what impact did it have, what have you measured, what did it tell you, you know, what could others adopt, and so on. And that that's now beginning to roll, which is fantastic. We've got an update coming through to to PAS 2080, which was obviously um, mentioned a little bit earlier on this morning by Anne-Marie Tre Trevelyan. Um, so uh, that obviously it's, a, it's, a, it's an existing piece of guidance that's out there, but at the moment it largely speaking isn't mandated. Um, we are, from an ICE point of view, leading the authorship of an update to that, and the intent is to make that then free to everybody to use and something that could be quite easily built into 
um, you know, requirements and specifications and that kind of thing um, as soon as it's available. So that should be with us, or well, certainly within within the year in terms of turning that one around. Um, I think the challenges, I mean, gosh, there's an awful lot going on out there. We still have a real issue with carbon literacy. A lot of people use the words, they don't understand them. And they think that by using the words, it's like buzzword bingo kind of thing. That, that, that really is a problem. We have a lot of targets being set that are meaningless both at a corporate level, but also at project level. Um, we need to really, really combat that. Um, and I think, you know, overall, we just need to sort of raise the bar in terms of that understanding, because if we can inch that upwards, we will find that we have a better quality uh, of conversation and therefore more potential for change going forward. And, and I would come back to my point around speed and the need to accelerate on all of this, because we do not have time to faff around for years getting that bit right. We just actually have to get it broadly right and, and get on with it. Yeah, of course, of course, Rachel, and and the understanding piece is is critical, isn't it? I think back to the one of the themes already of this morning around collaboration. It, it's collaborating more to get the greatest effect quickest, as opposed to competing. Um, yeah, let's get a common understanding and and work together to a common plan. Um, so, Bridget, just to bring you into this quest, same question, then, um, have you got a view from the National Infrastructure Commission's? perspective then on on this particular point uh, well yes i mean i suppose this is very much um moving us into our preparation for the next um national infrastructure assessment uh because we did one so we're doing them every five years we published the first one in 2018 it took about three years to do that first one but it's going to take a similar amount of time i think to to do this one The uncertainties about the future what do you need to do what can you do sooner how do you accelerate pace how do you get flexibility into into that thinking so and i think in particular what we're thinking about is um as i said i think a bit, a bit earlier actually zero um circular economy and net zero but also net gain environmental net gain as themes which can kind of pull you through into a more imaginative way of thinking and a more adaptive way of thinking and i think that that for me how we think now not to kind of not to pin down the things that we can pin down that will make a big impact but not to try and pin down the things that you that to leave open and leave open in the contract actually and this is i think the real challenge for writing contracts to leave open the uh, ability to continue to flex those Again, coming back to my EBSFLEET experience uh, so many years ago um, and thinking about that, we put in actually, and, and, and we need also to engage with planners, incidentally, and for planning permissions, we put in for a flexible planning permission so that it, within a, an, a built environment envelope, it could be up to different mixes of residential or industrial or, or whatever, because we didn't know what the future was going to look like. And I think we need to consider how to incorporate into contract writing the ability to flex different aspects of your of your delivery and that requires therefore the collaboration and open book uh, contracting to be able to flex things as you go through rather than pin it all down on day one and it requires the client to recognize that that will require some budget envelopes and how you think about contingency in that and who's carrying the risk of that contingency is one of the big questions, I think, because one of the things that we've seen um, in, in particularly in public sector contracting, that trying to pass the risk onto entities that don't have the capacity to handle that and where you're getting scope creep as well as, uh, you know, as public and government want to change the way of operating and respond to, to public uh, pressure. That's where the whole thing begins to run out of control and budgets get by budgets run out of control and so on. So how do we control, make sure that we know we're controlling the bits we can control? We're being imaginative about the bits that we could do something better in, but we need a little bit more work to do. And we also know where the con risk on contingencies is sitting. Uh, and, and we need to think a lot harder about that, in my opinion. Yeah, I I agree, Bridget. Thank you for that. I think you made a similar point before or built upon it uh, in your presentation around sort of the policy, policy implementation or policy drafting and government setting, um, setting the stuff all out versus 
contractually how can that then happen or how can we make that work and you know I think NEC is in a really good position to be able to help to do that from a flexible collaborative way as well um, so thank you for that one. Matt there's a question for you here um, how can government support the implementation of modern methods of construction which which we know can have an impact a big impact positively on uh, the net zero Thank, thanks, John. So, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there's lots of things we are doing currently and, and can do going forward. I mean, for, from our perspective, we are rolling out a, as I said, a sort of implementation program, which is is, is a sort of mixture of a, a training offer for contracting authorities. And the plan is to have, what would, you know, a sort of deep dive training course on MMC specifically. Um, and then also to have a, a sort of small resource and um, that can be parachuted into to projects to help on the sort of detail of actually doing that in practice. Um, so, so there's a couple of things that we're planning to roll out to, to sort of help do that in practice, because I think we recognise, you know, it is a very different way of doing things. And, and you know, certainly if people have been used to a traditional construction environment, that they're going to need some support in doing that. So, so that's what we're proposing to, to offer but you know we would be you know we're very much in the market for ideas around that as well and you know it you know it'd be interesting to get this group's reflections on whether they think there's particular things we should be doing John. Great thanks Matt I, th I think just to add that from a, a, a personal perspective in, in my role I do know there's there's um, several departments who uh, who have MMC modern methods of construction um, decision making first as opposed to traditional uh, which is great from a defence and a justice point of view definitely um, education as well we know are um, a leading in that particular space too so I think there's lots going on, on from a, a government perspective from MMC uh, and we'll yeah we'll continue to definitely do so um, there's a question from uh, from Rob, Rob Gerard here. So, Rachel, I guess it's aimed at yourself. How does the ICE engage with 300 plus countries and very many professional bodies in the world to promote decarbonisation? Well, wow. very, very good question. Very good question because this comes back to the piece around this. This is a this is a whole whole planet problem, isn't it? So, I guess I would start. Um, I mean, in terms of the, I guess the wider kind of political. Um, landscape and so on, it is fair to say we've seen a, a huge set of shifts in the last 12 to 18 months, um, not least, I mean, you can look at the US and, and obviously the, the election result there and so on. There are some fairly significant players who perhaps previously uh, were rather quiet, should we say, in terms of climate commitments, where actually there is, there is a very rapid shift underway, which is making it a, a topic which is far more um, acceptable, palatable, call it what you will, um, you know, sort of a po politically um, allowed, I, I suppose, in, in far more places around the world. Um, obviously, COP26 is also adding to the appetite and the energy from a, from a United Nations point of view, which obviously draws in an awful lot of people. Um, from an ICE point of view, looking outwards, we, we have uh, 95 odd thousand members, um, roughly, well, there's, there's tens of thousands of those who are based, uh, you know, outside the UK and in other places around the world. So there is there is quite a lot of engagement in terms of just trying to make sure that a consistent message is heading out that way. But in terms of other things that we've been doing, I mean, very recently, uh, we formed um, a, a partnership or we've gone into the partnership with something called ICSI, which is the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure, which, it, which includes partners such as the, the Global Covenant of Mayors, um, and also um, has an involvement with the American Society of Civil Engineers and similar. So actually that gets us into potentially, I think it's 126 countries across six different continents. So that, that's not bad in terms of, you know, starting to, to provide a route through in terms of both sharing learning, but also picking up on best practice and lessons and engagement and so on from, from around the world. Um, I think the, the other thing I would just mention is that we have to remember with the nature of this problem that every place in the world is starting from a different context. Geography really matters here in, in the grand scheme of things. So it is not the case that everywhere is like the UK. It is not the case that, you know, everywhere else is like anywhere that any of you might be sitting right now. So it is really important in terms of leadership in this space to remember that there is a need for sensitivity. There's going to be a need for context 
specific solutions and, and a recognition that the urgency and, and the type of answers are going to vary quite significantly. And when you roll that right up to the top level, round here, should we say, in this community, it's all about the decarbonisation, because we are, generally speaking, part of the industrialised world where we have benefited for the last 200 years from the fact that we've uh, gone down this rather fossil fueled route um, to, to, to industrial progress and all the rest of it. For a lot of places around the world, of course, we have to remember that it's about essentially encouraging the non-carbonisation of their different societies. And that is a whole different set of challenges in terms of, you know, maintaining the potential for growth and for social justice and for all the big picture sustainability outcomes that we're after, whether they're environmental or social or economic, we have to remember that we need to help to find ways to achieve that without passing through the same route that we have. Otherwise, there is a very, very real risk that all the effort we make on one side of the coin, if you like, is undone by, by others behaving in a way that, that you know, is, is less helpful, should we say, and cuts against it in the other side of things. So this, again, is a monstrously complicated um, challenge. But I think, you know, the, the, it feels at least that the, the time is is right to be able to have some of these conversations and certainly coming back to COP26 there is a huge opportunity at the end of this year to try to I suppose you know, have, have a new a different conversation around some of this and try to make sure that some of those points actually do come through in a, in a productive way. Yeah thanks Rachel yeah I totally agree I think context is hugely important isn't it massively important actually in, in this space and yeah at least I think that this, this country is moving in the right direction. COP26 is, as you've said, a, a really good step forward uh, in this space. So, yeah, it's it's collaborating again, isn't it, worldwide, <laughs> which is important. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to just, there's one final question, actually. Um, it's for Matt, if I can sort of summarise it uh, around the how best to approach sort of the conflict between um, short-term funding um, versus portfolio type approach um, versus the impact on uh, engaging SMEs? Yeah, thanks, John. So the question is around the sort of sometimes the mismatch between, as we've got at the moment, a sort of shorter spending review period and the, and the you know, the ambition set out in the document for, for uh, longer term contracting. Is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah, so I mean, I suppose the first thing I'd say is um, the Treasury were, you know, part of our working group for the, for the development of, of the playbook and have signed up to the, you know, the principles um, that are in it. Um, but but again, you're right to say there is a sort of, you know, there is a, a natural tension between um, the sort of fiscal flexibility that the Treasury might want to keep um, over over the sort of medium term and um, and some of the, you know, proposals that are set out in, in the documents. I think, you know, the, the way that gets resolved is through making really powerful cases for the benefits that will come from, from longer term contracting. And so, you know, one of the things we're, we're doing is obviously working across the public sector and industry to, to gather examples of where, you know, there are real, real world benefits that come from taking this approach. And I think, you know, that, that sort of evidence, I think, will need to be fed into uh, conversations that departments have with have with the treasury about um uh, about you know what what the right um what the right length of settlement is for different projects i mean you'll have seen even in the last sr where actually it was a sort of overall one year settlement there were a number of projects that got longer term deals um and you know i think the work we did as 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 part of this program fed into you know sort of making the case for that so um Hopefully that answers answers the question, John. It's quite a, it's quite a big question for um, one minute too. But. It, yeah, it is, Matt. It is. I recognise that. But thank you, um, thank you. I think again, in continuing the theme, it, it's it's about sort of being bold, isn't it, and, and being brave and, and taking that step forward. And yeah, not all of the times will we get it right, but uh, the small steps forward are going to help us succeed. So yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, so and just just to add to that, one of the things the NIC does is absolutely to try and set those long term programs in place and make sure government is signed up to those long term programs where it's necessary to have government funding so that you get that link across from the short into the longer term. It does, Bridget, you're right. Thank you. And, and there's some successes, isn't there, particularly in, in transport space. So, yeah, thank you for that. 
so that's all we've got time for um in terms of the morning session now so thanks for to everybody for uh, for coming and if you've got any more questions please send them through to the the nec team and we'll we'll try and get back to you as quick as we can on those um a copy of the slides and the recording will be forwarded to you after the conference by the events team uh, so you'll be able to capture everything uh, and just a few final points from a training perspective before we adjourn um the uh, ICE uh, training have some training courses related directly to carbon management. We can see on the slide there uh, in infrastructure. So please make sure you uh, you check those out. NEC also uh, offer an impressive training portfolio on the websites, uh, which is good. So remember, as users, you can you can access these. So please do so. Uh, and in addition to that, we're we're offering NEC are offering a ten percent discount here. Um, for uh, NEC publications for all conference delegates. So please access those and, and utilize the um, the discount there to your advantage, which is NEC Books 10. Um, and finally, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to all of our speakers um, today. I personally found those presentations really helpful, really informative and really, really powerful and um, common. As, as I guess you'd expect, but the themes coming across all of the discussions, um, yeah, we're, we're really consistent, which is pleasing always to see. So I hope to see you at the afternoon's workshop at one o'clock on um, best practice in NEC contracts for delay damages by our NEC consultants, Patrick Waterhouse and David Hunter. So um, please make sure you access those and enjoy them and yeah enjoy the rest of your day and of course we've got the two days following this as well so thank you again to everybody and enjoy the following on sessions take care now thank you very much thanks john thanks everyone thank you, thank you. that was great